Good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht. I am Vice President of Membership of the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I'd like to welcome you to our NSS Space Forum. I was a teenage space reporter. So this is actually the 19th Space Forum Town Hall we've done so far this year. And we've done about 50 since we started this uh, during the pandemic. So it's been really exciting. We've had a lot of great speakers and panelists and discussions, and we have another good one for you tonight. As always, I'd like to start off with some Space Forum, uh, uh, the agenda. We'll talk a little bit about the virtual etiquette some announcements, what's coming up with our space forums and town halls, and then we'll get right into the program and then we'll close for the evening. I always like to start off with the virtual etiquette. To submit a question, it's best to use the Q&A function because that's the only thing seen by the panelists. Uh, and it's easy to uh, take them in and then ask them. If you do put questions in the chat, we sometimes have to track them down because there are a lot of other comments, other things like that. So use the Q&A. If you do use the chat, I just ask you be respectful of the panelists and the audience. And it is best to view the session in speaker mode. So that way when the speaker is talking, the speaker's view is highlighted. I encourage everyone to give to our cause. I hope you're enjoying the programming of our space forums and town halls. So I encourage you to make a donation to support the NSS. We operate uh, as a all volunteer base and your donations and your membership help support all of our activities. So I'll thank you in advance for that. And following the session, please complete the post space forum survey. It only takes a few minutes to complete. It's anonymous and your feedback has helped us in planning future events. So what's coming up in terms of our space forums and town hall? You can always check out our library on our space.nss.org website. Uh, we have a link to all of the previous space forums and the recordings that are on our YouTube channel. So make sure you do that. So what's coming up next? Uh, three weeks from tonight, we're taking the rest of August off in the beginning of September. So we've got the NSS Policy Committee with Randy Giganti, who is the chair, and he's actually on in, tonight, uh, and also Charles Elzey, the vice chair. And this is gonna be a really interesting discussion. We get a lot of questions about the NSS policy committee. How do they make determinations on what NSS does support and so on, the position papers. So you'll be able to ask a lot of great questions about that. On the 23rd, we have another longtime NSS member, Marianne Dyson who just wrote a book on shuttle mission control. And she's gonna talk about some of the experiences of the shuttle mission controllers. It's a really great book, so I encourage you to not miss that. We are working now on our October schedule and the November schedule. So we should be able to have all that for you uh, at the next meeting on the 9th. So now it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our guest speaker this evening. I know we've tried to mix things up in terms of our topic areas. We've done some history, we've done technology, we've done policy, we've talked about NSS itself and our benefits and some of our programs. And tonight, you know, is a look back. Two weeks ago, we looked forward with the SLS. Tonight, we're gonna look back on Apollo 11 and it's a unique personal experience that you're gonna hear about today. So, uh, Dr. David Chudwin is a physician, an author, and a teenage space reporter. He actually grew up during Sputnik, was seven years old when Sputnik was launched, and like a lot of us, became very interested in the space program, followed it all through his early years, uh, and became a reporter for his high school newspaper, and then his college newspaper, the Michigan Daily. And because he was so interested in space, he actually applied for and received a NASA credential, press credential, to cover the Apollo 11 launch. So it's a really great story. He wrote a book about it back in 2019 for the 50th anniversary. And you're gonna hear from him tonight. And we also have a special guest with us as well. We'll, we'll introduce him shortly too. 
So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to talk about, I was a teenage space reporter. Let me just um, get the uh, correct. Uh, yep, you can get started. PowerPoint up here. I'm. Um, there you go. Looks like it's working. You got it. It's sharing. Okay, super. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Bert for inviting me uh, to this program. And it's a special honor for me to talk to a National Space Society forum. Uh, back in the early 80s, I was a member of both the L5 Society and the National Space Institute uh, before they uh, joined forces. So I, I've been a member of the National Space Society for many, many years. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about today was the unique experiences uh, that I had covering Apollo 11. And this all starts when I was born. Uh, wait, let's see. The, um, I'm having trouble here moving the screen. You should be able just to use the arrow in your, on your yeah, the, the arrow's not arrow's not doing it. Um, so I was, let me just figure this out. I'm gonna stop share okay. and get back into it in the share screen. And then what I need to do is um, see if this will do it. No, I'm, I apologize about this technical stuff. Um, what I need to do is get back onto the screen, the PowerPoint screen. And it's not allowing me to um, put- There you okay. go. Whatever you there did worked. Whatever I did worked. Okay. You should be able to use your mouse and just click it. So if you just go back. Okay, let's see. No, it's going forward. So I'm old enough that I used a um, slide rule when I was in high school and college. So I'm not very technologically oriented here. And uh, of course this is happening. Uh, Why don't you escape, use it, just hit your escape button so you can get out of the, out of the slideshow. There you okay. go. And then get it back, you can get it back to the starting point. Okay. Technology is fun, yes. Okay, from the beginning. Yep, from the beginning, yeah. Okay. There and you go. Now I, now I can go. Okay, again, I, I apologize for that. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to talk about is two things. First of all, is my experiences covering Apollo 11 as a 19 year old college reporter. And then I also wanna talk about some of the lessons uh, that, that we've learned from the Apollo program. So I grew up with a space program. Uh, I was born 7-11-1950. Now I'm not superstitious, but it was an auspicious year to be born in. Uh, if I would have bo been born later, uh, I would have been too young to cover Apollo 11. And if I would have uh, been born sooner, uh, I would have been too old uh, to uh, be a college reporter. So um, I'm a child of the 1950s. Uh, I was seven years old when the Russians launched Sputnik in October, 1957. And uh, I was influenced by uh, TV shows and books at a very young age. Um, this is a picture of uh, Walt Disney and Werner von Braun taken in uh, 1954 at the Redstone Arsenal. And uh, they agreed to collaborate on television shows, uh, segments of uh, Walt Disney's Disneyland. And uh, they did shows on uh, traveling to space. They did shows on a space station, a circular space station, and they did shows on going to Mars. Uh, some of the content of this was based on articles in Collier's Magazine between 1952 and 1954. Uh, a, a group of uh, space enthusiasts headed by Von Braun uh, wrote a series of articles for Collier's Magazine. And this was very influential because it, it wasn't science fiction. They presented realistic and factual accounts of how we would be going in, into outer space. Now, uh, I was influenced by fact books. And this is the first book that I ever owned. Uh, it uh, was a, a book called Space Pilots 
by the German rocket scientist, Willy Ley. Uh, and uh, this was my, it was published in 1957 and it was my uh, eighth birthday present in July of uh, 1958. Uh, and it's rather battered, but I still have it. And it's, it's fascinating to, to look at this and to compare what was predicted in the near future to what actually happened. I was also influenced by science fiction as well, uh, by the novels by authors like Robert Heinlein. Uh, one of my favorites was Half Space Suit Will Travel. Uh, and uh, he wrote a series of uh, so-called juvenile novels uh, which uh, um, described our future in space. Uh, and uh, there were other science fiction authors as well, such as Isaac Asimov, who predicted the robotic uh, uh, revolution. Now, um, as I got into teenagehood, I actually got a chance to meet some real astronauts. Uh, in 1965, after the Gemini 4 mission, uh, Jim McDivitt and uh, Ed White came to Chicago, which was Jim McDivitt's birthplace. They had a big civic celebration. And one of the, uh, one of the events was a um, reception for high school students where they did a Q&A and, and met in person with a large number of high school students. And I and a, a good friend of mine, Marv Rubenstein, uh, were able to go and meet uh, Jim McDivitt and Ed White in 1965. In 1966, there was another Chicago area astronaut, Eugene Cernan, uh, who along with Tom Stafford was on the Gemini 9 mission. Uh, they also came to Chicago and uh, went to an event in uh, the suburbs uh, of Chicago. Uh, Gene Cernan was from Bellwood, Illinois, outside of Chicago. But we went there and there was a event at the high school. And again, I was with uh, Marv Rubenstein and we met uh, Cernan and Stafford, but we also uh, met uh, Cernan's uh, mother and uh, Rose Cernan and his, um, his sister Dee uh, and uh, more about that later. So I finished high school and went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and almost immediately joined the Michigan Daily. Uh, the Michigan Daily has a very long history of being a student run independent newspaper. And it had a large staff, but it seemed like I was the only one on the staff interested in space whatsoever. Uh, and uh, so I was a, a lowly freshman on the staff uh, during the flight of Apollo 7, the, the first Apollo flight after the fire. This was in October, 1968. And I was asked to write an editorial about it. Now this was unusual for several reasons. First of all, I was merely a, a freshman and usually freshmen didn't write uh, editorials. And, and secondly, uh, among the sta daily staff was uh, uh, somewhat left-wing politically and had very little interest in science and space. Uh, but I did write uh, an editorial which was published in the Daily called A Case for Outer Space that actually reads pretty good today, uh, many years later. Uh, so I did uh, reporting and uh, some uh, assistant night editing and things like that for the Michigan Daily. Uh, here's a picture of me and you can see I have a, a, had a little bit more hair than that I have now. Uh, so as the Apollo program got going, uh, the um, decision was made in December 1968 uh, to send Apollo 8 to the moon. Uh, it was supposed to be a flight with the lunar module, but the, uh, the problem was, was the lunar module wasn't at all ready. It was behind in both schedule and budget. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the decision was made to send the Apollo 8 crew on the first manned the first crewed Apollo flight um, to orbit the moon. Uh, this was a very gutsy decision. So uh, this in Christmas at, at this point, um, I was back at home in the Chicago area from Ann Arbor and I got together with uh, my friend Marv Rubenstein and uh, we were talking and Marv suggested, why don't we go see a launch? And we, were, we had just turned 18 uh, in July and then, and then him in September. And so we'd be able to, uh, to travel. And uh, it sounded like a great idea. So we decided to, um, to look into it. 
Uh, and there were several aspects to make this come, become a reality. Um, first, the subsequent Apollo flights needed to work okay. And one of the big ones was Apollo 9. Uh, this is really a, an important flight, which I don't think is, receives as much credit as some of the other Apollo missions, but it, it proved out the lunar module uh, and the um, ascent and descent stage of the lunar module uh, in, in Earth orbit. Now, we looked at the NASA schedule and we saw that in May, a dress rehearsal of going to the moon was uh, scheduled. Uh, this was Apollo 10. Uh, commanded by um, Tom Staff Stafford uh, with uh, John Young as the command module pilot and Gene Cernan as the lunar module pilot. And we decided not to take any um, concrete steps uh, until then. So the Apollo 11 was scheduled uh, to lift off July 16th, 1969. This, this uh, target date was set months in advance. Uh, whether it was going to be the first lunar landing or not was uncertain, depending on whether the results of the previous missions were good. After Apollo 10, uh, the uh, decision for us to go to Florida was, was a go. Uh, the first step was trying to find a place to stay because it was expected that hundreds of thousands of people would be there. Um, all the nice hotels were either too expensive or totally booked up. So, um, I found a dive called the Sea Missile Motel. And uh, this was an old property there. Uh, it, it advertised having a TV in each room and it had a swimming pool as, as well. Uh, and uh, so they um, had rooms available at $10 a night. Now, again, you must remember this is 1969 and uh, there was, this was uh, pre-inflationary. Uh, and so, um, and this was also before the internet. So the may, way we made the reservation uh, was by a phone call and then by a letter with a check for $10. And the way the motel responded back was with the postcard here shown on this screen uh, that, uh, that they acknowledged receipt of our $10 deposit. Uh, and originally we were gonna stay July 13th through 18th. This was later uh, extended. Uh, the second thing we needed to do was to get to uh, Kennedy Space Center to Cape Canaveral uh, for the Apollo 11 launch. And this is a copy of my airplane ticket. Now, in those days, people going to the Cape uh, often flew to the Melbourne, Florida airport. Uh, at, at that point, or the Orlando airport was not as much of a hub as it is now. Uh, so, you know, in recent years, when I've gone to the Cape, I've usually uh, flown to Orlando and, and taken a rental car. But uh, in, in this case, in, in that era, uh, took a uh, Eastern Airlines jet from Chicago to Tampa, and then a, a second jet uh, from uh, Tampa to Melbourne. And you can see on the ticket that the fare then was $94.50. Uh, again, this is, is pre-inflation. So we had a, had a motel had airplane tickets. Then came the really difficult part. And that was getting a press pass uh, for myself and, and Marv. Uh, up till then, NASA had not accredited student journalists. Uh, they were considered students and not professional journalists. So, uh, you know, I wrote to them and, and uh, you know, was told about that policy, but I didn't give up. And my ace in the hole was that uh, a, a senior editor of the Daily, a, a friend of mine named Jim Heck, uh, was going to be in Washington and was going to be the managing editor of something called the College Press Service Wire Network. The College Press Service was a consortium of about 500 uh, college and university newspapers. And again, this was before the internet. So the way they exchanged stories uh, was uh, on this, this wire network. So Jim, being a great friend, um, went to NASA Public Affairs in person and made the argument that I was not covering Apollo 11 for the Michigan Daily, but I was covering it for this um, college press service uh, representing all of the, the college um, newspapers. So um, Jim was a very persuasive guy and I got a letter shortly after that saying that uh, after 
two weeks of visiting NASA Public Affairs and sending them a letter and making arguments that they ag agreed that me and Marv could uh, get a uh, press pass. Uh, and uh, this kind of set a precedent uh, because in, in subsequent launches, there were a few college journalists who were able to get press passes. And some of them have gotten in touch with me and actually thanked me for uh, blazing the trail. Uh, so um, there were over 3,500 uh, press requests for Apollo 11. Uh, and uh, Jim said in his letter that, that, uh, that we were given these two press passes uh, instead of people from uh, certain foreign countries. Uh, so I had gotten the letter from Jim, but I didn't have the press pass in my hand. And, and so every day I went out to the mailbox and uh, checked the mail to see if the press pass was there. And then finally this press pass showed up and uh, I, I couldn't believe it because I knew that a press pass would give unprecedented access uh, to the facilities and uh, experiences uh, at the Cape. Now, Marv and I went to O'Hare Airport uh, on uh, July 13th. This was three days before the scheduled launch. And we're standing at the Eastern Airlines counter at O'Hare. And who do we see but Mrs. Rose Cernan we, and, uh, and her daughter Dee. We had recognized them from uh, the uh, Gemini 9 event uh, at, at the high school. And so we went up and said hello to them and found out that Mrs. Cernan was um, flying down to Apollo 11 to see the launch like all these other people. So we said hello to her. Um, it, when the airplane stopped uh, in, uh, in Ad Atlanta before going to Melbourne, we said hello again. So we land in, at the Melbourne airport and a uh, gentleman in a brownish uh, um, shirt comes to say hello to her. And we look and see that this was Alan Bean uh, who, had been, who was scheduled to uh, be on the next mission, Apollo 12. Uh, apparently, Gene could not pick up his mother. He was on other, uh, had other responsibilities that day. And so Alan came to pick up his mom. So uh, Mrs. Cernan in introduced us to Alan Dean. He's, he's on the, the left in this slide. And then there were three other gentlemen with, with Alan Dean. Uh, one was in a NASA flight suit. And so it was obvious that he was an astronaut. And it turns out that it was Jim Irwin. Uh, who walked on the moon on Apollo 15, and also uh, Charlie Duke, who walked on the moon on Apollo 16, and Bruce McCandless, who did the first untethered spacewalk. So here we are within uh, 20 minutes of landing in Florida, and we met with three of the 12 men who walked on the moon, uh, just arriving there. Uh, and uh, they were friendly. We took some pictures. Uh, Jim Irwin snapped a picture of me and Alan Bean together. Uh, at that point, he was the only one with a flight assignment. So it was kind of the celebrity of the group. And uh, they were there to pick up family members uh, who were also coming down to, uh, to see, the, see the launch. So um, we checked into the uh, um, motel and uh, took a swim and then uh, waited till the next morning to pick up our rental car. And with our rental car, we went to the NASA News Center. Uh, because of over 3,000 journalists there, NASA set up a special Apollo 11 News Center on Highway A1A in a, a two-story industrial building across from the Hilton. And I understand that this building is, is still there. But uh, in, in the basement was a, a sound stage uh, for press conferences. In the upper floor uh, were um, uh, tables laden with uh, fact sheets and uh, press kits and, uh, and the opportunities to sign up for tours and for press conferences. Uh, and so uh, we signed up for a long uh, six hour uh, minibus tour with a NASA contractor that had special access. So we were able to get uh, with, within less than 2000 feet here of the Apollo 11 Saturn V. Uh, the rockets attached to the red launch umbilical tower and the gray mobile service structure. 
uh, at the time. And you can get some idea of the scale of this thing. If you look towards the base of the rocket on the top of the concrete pad, there's some uh, fuel trucks there and you can see how huge this rocket was. The rocket itself was 363 feet tall. Uh, the other thing we were able to do on this tour is um, close up and personal with the launch, um, um, I'm sorry, with the, the crawler transporter, uh, this device that moved the rocket from the vehicle assembly building seen in the back um, to the launch pad 39. Uh, and so we were able to get up close, it was a huge uh, structure. Uh, we were able, because of the, the special access, to actually go into vehicle assembly building. And we were on the floor of the vehicle assembly building. And this was us right close at, to the bottom of the next Apollo Saturn V rocket. This was used for Apollo 12. And you can see how closely we were. There's a couple of technicians who um, are there. And these are two of the huge F-1 rockets uh, that launched uh, the Saturn V. And uh, right to the um, right of the center is one of the hold down arms that uh, kept the rocket uh, on the pad until it was ready to take off. Now, not only were we able to go inside the, the vehicle assembly building, we were also able to go into the launch control center. And this is a picture uh, three days, two days before of the um, crew that was getting ready to launch Apollo 11. Uh, there were glass observation booths and we were able to uh, um, see from the booths, uh, the uh, flight, the launch controllers uh, actually uh, doing their work. An even more special experience was we were able to go into a firing room number three, which wasn't being used. And we're actually able to go walk on the floor of Launch Control Center. And the slide on the right shows the flight uh, launch director's council. And you can see what was considered advanced technology in 1969. Uh, and then the other one, the other uh, photo on, on the left shows uh, again, the 1969 advanced electronics. We also were able to go to uh, certain um, press conferences. And one of the most amazing one was what was called the um, uh, center director's briefing. But these were the heads of some of the main NASA centers and NASA officials. Uh, and um, on the left was Werner von Braun, who was head of the Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, Kurt Debus, head of Kennedy Space Center, uh, George Miller, who was the head of manned space flight, uh, and Robert Gilruth, uh, who was head of the manned spacecraft center, now known as the Johnson Space Center. And finally, um, uh, and finally, the head of the um, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Another press conference was, wait, let me get back here. Okay, another press conference was um, two nights before Apollo 11, the press was allowed to do a remote interview with um, Armstrong Aldrin uh, and, uh, um, and Collins. Uh, they were in their crew quarters at the Kennedy Space Center. And we in the press uh, were at uh, the, the, uh, on the first floor of the Apollo 11 News Center. Uh, and you can see the, um, the, the journalists there uh, on the left was Walter Cronkite uh, of CBS News, um, Al Rossiter Jr. of UPI, uh, Everett Clark and uh, Joel Shurkin. Uh, and a good friend of mine, actually in a NASA photograph of this, found a picture of me at the conference. And if you look on the right of the lower photograph, there's a guy with a full head of hair and glasses and a camera. And that's actually me at this, uh, at this news conference. After the news conference, we had the possibility to go out to pad 39 and see Apollo 11 Saturn V lit up by xenon lights. These are high intensity lights. And this was one of the most remarkable sights of, of the trip. Uh, you know, I described that time as like a jewel in the night. Uh, and the, uh, the photograph really doesn't capture uh, the, the full beauty of, of this. Uh, 
Now the next day we took another shorter tour and we saw the mobile service structure being pulled away from the Apollo 11 Saturn V. And this is a picture uh, of that after the mobile service structure has been pulled away, the rocket's still attached to the launch umbilical tower. And uh, you can see the liquid hydrogen tank uh, with the understated warning, no smoking. Uh, and then our plan was to um, watch the Apollo 11 launch from the Pad 39 press site. Uh, as you can see, there were grandstands with uh, um, space for reporters and people were setting up uh, cameras and things like that. Uh, but we were very lucky. Um, we were able to get a pass uh, to go visit the um, crew quarters in the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building, now called the Armstrong ONC Building, to watch the astronauts walk out the morning of July 16th. Uh, and uh, this is a photograph I took of uh, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin uh, leaving the MSOB, uh, their last steps on Earth before uh, going to the moon. Here's a picture of Collins and Aldrin. And then behind them um, are uh, two uh, space suit technicians. One is uh, Joe Schmidt, who was one of the first space suit technicians. And the young guy next to him is actually Ron Woods. Ron was with the space program for many, many years and has become a noted space artist. Uh, and then behind those two is, uh, with his uh, partially cut off, is, is Deke Slayton. But uh, this is what we saw. And as they walked out of the uh, MSOB, there was kind of a mad rush among the press to take photographs and to, um, uh, and, and to get good pictures. And it was very frustrating because this was before electronic cameras. So I had no idea for two weeks afterwards whether these pictures actually turned out. So then instead of, um, instead of uh, watching the launch from the uh, um, press site, we had the opportunity to uh, go to the VIP site. This was uh, three grandstands, the other side of the VA, VAB from the press site. And NASA had invited over 3000 uh, individuals uh, connected to the space program to, uh, to watch it. And uh, this was, uh, one of the main people there was President Lyndon Johnson, who had been kind of the godfather of the space program when he headed the Space Committee in the Senate and as uh, um, uh, President Kennedy's vice president. Uh, but he was there along with his wife, Lady Bird. And if you look um, at the uh, lower right, uh, there's a lady with a white hat who's blocking a view of James Webb, uh, the, first the first administrator of, of NASA and after whom the James Webb Telescope is, uh, um, is named. But he was there sitting uh, next to Mrs. Johnson and, uh, and LBJ. So Marv and I walked out in front of the VIP stand and there was this long expanse of grass uh, between the VIP stand and pad 39A. And Precisely at 9.32 a.m., which had been planned months in advance, uh, the, the rocket lit off. Uh, and uh, there's the classic recording of uh, Jack King, the voice of launch control, uh, describing it. So we watched the launch, but we didn't hear anything because light travels faster than sound. The sound didn't reach us at all. Uh, so we saw the flame come out of the base of the rocket and then shoot out to the side uh, because of deflectors uh, and then just kind of sat there. And at the time we weren't sure uh, if everything was okay or not, because it just, it sat there, it didn't do anything. We couldn't hear anything. And then very gradually it rose up off the pad and it took like eight or nine seconds for it to clear the tower. And that was about the same time we started hearing the sound. And the sound was just overwhelming we could feel the sound, it was like pounding on our chest. The ground was shaking, the noise was uh, deafening. Uh, and as the rocket rose, we could actually feel some heat uh, from, from the rocket. It was a very uh, impressive uh, performance. So after that, I stayed uh, at Kennedy Space Center for the, the landing. 
and uh, followed the landing from the uh, um, from the NASA press center uh, while Marv went home. And uh, I don't know if Marv has some additional comments uh, if if he's on right now uh, about the experience of seeing the launch. Well, the launch was indescribable. Uh, I've never seen or heard anything like it since. Um, it's just amazing. Uh, the one impression I say is, you you see the rocket, you hear the sound, but it, it's you don't have you don't perceive the fit. Normally, when you hear a loud noise, you know what direction it's from. This sound totally engulfed us. We were part of it. The, the vibrations just vibrated through your body. You were totally surrounded. Your body's being buffeted. Your clothes are rippling from the uh, uh, effects. You, you, the the ground is shaking. Um, at the moment of ignition, we had no idea what to expect. Uh, we were set while we were awaiting the countdown. We were with some engineers, and they said, you know, they couldn't really describe it either. They just said, you know, you're going to see something pretty special. But um, we we you know when the countdown reaches zero, something amazing is going to occur. But you don't know exactly what or what it's going to feel like. Every sense in your body is being triggered. And it, it's just the most amazing sound experience. The colors, the sound, the vibration. It's, it, I've, I've never been so stimulated by anything, by one event. And obviously I'd like to see it again, if, if at all possible. I'm, I would like very much to uh, go down and see an SLS launch and see, and, you know, to compare the two. Otherwise, I, I can't add anything to Dave's discussion. It's excellent. Thanks, Marv. So I'd like to go get into the second part of the, the talk um, and talk about some of the lessons from, from Apollo. Um, one of the first lessons is to be bold, to set high goals. And there's uh, at least four examples of that uh, uh, during Project Apollo. Um, the first was setting the moon landing goal in 1961. Um, the second was choosing how to get to the moon with lunar orbit rendezvous. Um, the third was approving all up testing and the final was, uh, as we discussed before, the, the Lunar 8 orbital mission. So I'll just briefly go through each of these things. Um, President Kennedy proposed going to the moon on a speech before a joint session of Congress in May 5th, 1961. Uh, and this was clearly in the context of the Cold War. Uh, the month before he had sent a memo, a classified memo to Pre Vice President Johnson, asking him to look into what the United States could do where we could beat the Russians. Uh, his, his clear intent uh, was not so much to explore space, but to, to beat the Russians. And Johnson consulted widely in the government with NASA, the Department of Defense, uh, uh, Kennedy's scientific advisor, and uh, they felt that the United States could beat the Russians getting to the moon, and they thought it could be by 1968 uh, at the time. Uh, to give some leeway, uh, Kennedy said the end of the decade. Uh, and Kennedy gave a more extensive speech on going to the moon at Rice University in September uh, 1962. Uh, and again, the famous quote from Kennedy, we chose to go, we choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So that decision was made with only 15 minutes of US space experience. Uh, Alan Shepard previously in May had done a, a parabolic flight going up 115 miles and was in space only about 15 minutes or so. Uh, it was quite a leap of faith and confidence in, of Kennedy that the United States could go from 15 minutes on a suborbital flight uh, to uh, within uh, nine years or so of uh, landing people on the moon and, and bringing them that. So the first bold decision was actually deciding to go to the moon. Um, the second question was how to get to the moon. And the um, original uh, thoughts of uh, the um, early rocket scientists like Von Braun was to do a direct mission, uh, fly to the moon and, and fly back with this, uh, the same rocket. Uh, but this would require uh, technology that wasn't, wouldn't be available in, in the 1960s. Uh, so then for a while, the leading candidate was Earth Orbit Rendezvous, uh, where two spacecraft would be joined in Earth orbit and then, then fly to the moon. Um, the uh, um, end result of studies was something called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, where the two vehicles would 
dock in lunar orbit. Uh, and this was, again, very bold uh, suggestion because there hadn't been, as of that point, any rendezvous or docking uh, in, um, even in, in uh, Earth orbit. Uh, and uh, one of the main proponents of lunar orbit rendezvous was Dr. John Hobolt, uh, an engineer from uh, Langley Research Center uh, in Virginia. And uh, he pushed against odds uh, against uh, Von Braun and, and others uh, to go with lunar orbit rendezvous. And this proved to be a wise decision. Uh, the third bold step was a result of Dr. George Miller. Uh, George Miller was Associate Administrator of NASA for the Office of Manned Space Flight. Uh, and on the left is a picture of him with Bob Gilruth at, at a press conference that I took. And Marv and I actually had an opportunity to personally interview uh, Miller uh, for about 20 minutes uh, before the Apollo 11 launch. But one of the things that George Miller um, championed was all up testing. Uh, the, Von Braun and the Germans had always done sequential testing where they would test the first stage and then add the second stage to it and do tests and then add the third stage to it, do it and do tests. But uh, Miller argued that that was unrealistic and that you would get more uh, information and be able to move faster with all up testing. Uh, and this is why the first test of the Saturn V, the first uncrewed test of the Saturn V was, uh, was the entire vehicle. Uh, and again, we had mentioned that um, Apollo 8 was the first crewed Saturn V, uh, but there was no lunar module to, to test it with. Uh, so uh, George Lowe uh, proposed sending Apollo 8 to, uh, to orbit the moon. Um, he had to uh, persuade uh, Chris Kraft, who's at the bottom of that picture, as well as um, uh, George Gilruth, I'm sorry, Robert Gilruth at the top of the picture, head, head of the Manned Space Grad Center, uh, as well as Miller uh, to, uh, to approve this. And as we all know, Apollo 8 was one of the great successes of the, uh, of the Apollo program. Lesson number two is no bucks, no Buck Rogers. And uh, this has become almost a trite phrase, but the um, NASA budget peaked in 1966 at 4.4% of the total US budget. Uh, and it was $5.9 billion, $5 billion, which would be equivalent to $45 billion in 2018 dollars. Um, the current NASA budget is around 23 or 24 billion. Uh, and so you can see in the diagram that there is a huge increase uh, in the NASA budget uh, in the 1960s, but this was cut greatly uh, in the 1970s. And this had some serious results. Uh, as a result of the budget cuts, Apollo's 18 through 20 flights were canceled. And the Apollo applications project was reduced to just Skylab with three crewed flights. Uh, Dr. Miller had, had uh, proposed a very ambitious uh, Apollo applications project, which would have had multiple uh, orbital workshops like Skylab and, and long flights. And this, this got really uh, eliminated quite a bit. Um, the other result of these budget cuts in the 70s was this crazy kind of Rube Goldberg design of the space shuttle. Um, the original design of the space shuttle was to have it completely reusable uh, and be able to have the, the first stage of a, a multi-stage shuttle uh, fly back to earth. Uh, and what ended up um, due to Air Force requirements and budget limitations was that they made a space shuttle orbiter and the main engines would be the only components that would, would be able to uh, be recovered. Uh, and with the addition of these solid rockets, uh, there was no abort capability uh, in the er early stages uh, just, after, um, just after liftoff. And so this, um, this concern in many ways and, and changes in configuration uh, led to the, uh, uh, indirectly to the Challenger disaster uh, in which the uh, space shuttle uh, Challenger exploded, uh, killing the crew. Third lesson is to be inclusive. And if we look at the original seven Mercury astronauts, 
uh, we can see that uh, the one thing they share in common besides these shiny spacesuits uh, is that they're all uh, white male test pilots. Uh, and this was done, the test pilot part of it was done at the direction of President Eisenhower, who felt test pilots would be more capable uh, in, in this new environment. Of course, at the time, women were not allowed to be pilot, uh, military pilots, let alone test pilots. And so this kept uh, the um, 13 women who were tested uh, at, by Dr. Ellen Lovelace and found to meet the, the physical requirements uh, kept them out of the astronaut program, uh, and uh, and that. So in 1959, the, the standard astronaut was a uh, a white male test pilot. In preparation for the space shuttle, uh, NASA became more inclusive, and if you look at the 35 new guys TFNG group here, who were the original space shuttle pilots, you see that there are, there are um, six women. Uh, that there are um, three African Americans uh, and uh, and uh, Judy Resnick, who is the first Jewish American astronaut, as well as Allison Onizuka, Allison Onizuka who was the first uh, Asian American astronaut. Uh, so there was more uh, more inclusion in there. And then through the years, um, the opportunities have expanded as well. Uh, Charlie Bolden became both an astronaut and then later on a very successful NASA uh, administrator. Uh, and the, um, also the uh, women became for the first time shuttle commanders, um, Eileen Collins and Pam Melroy. Uh, Eileen Collins wrote a book uh, with my friend Jonathan Ward and that book is being released in October and I highly recommend it. Uh, Eileen Collins has an amazing personal story. Uh, and uh, besides being a wonderful woman as a person is, is also extremely accomplished. And as we know, Pam Melroy is currently the new deputy administrator of NASA. Uh, in, in a more um, uh, sensitive area, uh, when astronaut Sally Ride uh, passed away from pancreatic cancer, uh, it was revealed that she had a life partner, T Tam O'Shaughnessy, and so was the, the first uh, uh, publicly uh, acknowledged uh, LGBT uh, astronaut. And through uh, this diversity, you, you get uh, um, an inclusiveness. Uh, things uh, are in, improved uh, in that you get new and different perspectives. Uh, lesson number four is to um, be prepared. And NASA spent huge amounts of time and money uh, with uh, simulator training. And uh, in the photo on, on the upper right is Neil Armstrong and, and uh, Buzz Aldrin uh, in a lunar module sim simulator. Uh, and the photo below uh, shows uh, uh, them uh, with the, the sim soups, uh, simulate, simulator uh, supervisors. And these simulator supervisors would set up all kinds of fiendish uh, difficulties going wrong to um, train the crew for any special eventuality. And there were mission rules uh, and very detailed flight plans uh, that, that were used to uh, tr uh, train the astronauts. Uh, the flight plan on the right uh, was one that I obtained uh, at the Cape before Apollo 11. Uh, they gave uh, members of the press a single copy of the uh, Apollo 11 flight plan. And years later, I had it autographed by, uh, by Buzz Aldrin. And um, the final lesson is, is never give up. Um, and this applies both to um, uh, NASA and, and also personally as well. Um, NASA has faced some really difficult uh, situations. Uh, one of the worst was, of course, the Apollo 1 fire uh, in, in uh, January 1967, uh, which took the life of uh, Gus Grissom, uh, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. Uh, and uh, this was due to 100% uh, uh, oxygen atmosphere uh, in the capsule. And during a ground test, uh, there was a spark that uh, ignited uh, flame and uh, suffocated the, uh, the astronauts. Another, um, another uh, difficulty, of course, was the Apollo 13 flight. Uh, 
uh, where um, an oxygen tank in the service module blew up on the way to the moon. And it was only with some uh, ingenious planning uh, and cooperation between the flight crew and the ground that the uh, Apollo 13 uh, crew came back uh, alive and well. And uh, in, even this was been described in many ways, one of which I like is, is it was NASA's most successful failure. Uh, even though they weren't able to land on the moon, uh, they were able to, to get back alive. Uh, personally, uh, I like the idea of not giving up. Um, originally, as I told you before, um, NASA would not grant a, uh, a press pass. And it only was through some persistence and, and the help of uh, Jim Heck that I was actually able to get a press pass. And then finally, um, on the right is something uh, very special to me. Uh, when I was down at the Cape, I was able to get a, uh, a Apollo lunar orbit map. And years later, uh, I wondered about getting it autographed by, by Neil Armstrong. Um, Armstrong, early in his career, signed tens of thousands of autographs. But uh, uh, in years following Apollo 11, uh, he cut way back. So I sent this lunar orbit map to him through the mail, to him care of the ast astronaut. Uh, um, I sent it, to, I'm sorry, I sent it to him uh, to uh, his address in Cincinnati. He was in a farm outside Cincinnati at the time. And then I got it back marked refused. Uh, not even open, just refused. And I guess that was how they were handling the autograph requests. Um, I decided not to give up. So what I did was I um, mailed it to Armstrong in care of the astronaut office. Now they don't do this anymore, but years ago they would forward mail uh, from the astronaut office and apparently he got it. But weeks and weeks and weeks went by and but on um, July 20th, 1994, which is the 20th uh, anniversary of the, uh, um, of the moon landing, I'm sorry, the, the 25th anniversary of the moon landing, um, I went to the mailbox and in the mailbox was an envelope um, addressed to me and my hands were shaking as I opened it up. And inside, I found that uh, Neil Armstrong had inscribed a caller. Neil Armstrong had inscribed uh, the lunar orbit map uh, to me, uh, and I, I learned that that was probably one of the last things he signed because after the 25th anniversary, he almost never gave uh, any autographs. So, covering Apollo 11 was an incredible experience. Uh, and um, it really boosted my interest in space, which has been lifelong. And uh, it, um, it was uh, a unique time to, to be alive. Uh, and it was a great um, privilege as a 19 year old uh, to uh, see men leave the earth for the first time to land on the moon. So I'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, I see on the chat and Q&A that there's some questions. So let me look at the Q&A. Uh, I'll feed those to you, uh, David. Okay, good. Yeah, why don't you uh, stop sharing? Okay. Oh, perfect, great. Now we did get a few questions in and we had a, some that were submitted beforehand. So I wanna try to get a couple of those and uh, maybe even if we can ask Marvin uh, this first one as well. And, you know, obviously you chose uh, a STEM career, what we call it today, by becoming a physician. And as you were so enamored with the space program, did you ever consider a career path that might have taken you to the space program, maybe astronaut, engineer, or scientist? Yes, well, um, as a really young kid, I thought about becoming an astronaut, but then reality hit me. Um, first of all, uh, I'm af afraid of heights, unexposed heights. And I mean, I'm fine in an airplane, but uh, I would never climb a flagpole and you couldn't pay me a million dollars to skydive. Uh, and then uh, secondly, um, I'm a little bit claustrophobic as well. So that's probably not the best recipe for an astronaut. So I decided to become more of an armchair astronaut. 
And about, okay to ask uh, Marvin a, a, a similar question. Marvin, I know you've got a, a, a PhD in microbiology. So, uh, you know, was there ever a consideration for the space program? Yes, there was. Uh, in around early 1980s, uh, I was doing two dimensional gel uh, protein separations. And I actually wrote a protocol a proposal for NASA to be flown on the space lab. And their response was, they sent me an application as a mission specialist. So I did fill it out and submit it to NASA. So I did apply for the first stages, but um, I, I, I'm not a pilot. My piloting experience is, is about 20 minutes in a Cessna 150. I have no extraordinary experiences or anything unique to contribute. So my chances of getting accepted in that group are very, very nil. Thank you. I did get a we did get a question from a student, and I'd like to 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 uh, ask that one. Uh, uh, his name is let me see here. His name is uh, Beckett, and he's a fourth grader. And you know, following in your footsteps, uh, David, he wants to. He's curious what the requirements are to get press passes today, because he's a junior correspondent and would love to be able to cover something like this. <laughs> so what advice do you have? Well, you know, I think, first of all, you have to be lucky. There's a lot of things in life. And, and secondly, you need to take advantage of opportunities when, when they arise. Uh, currently, NASA will credit at times uh, some college uh, journalists. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they will not uh, uh, credit high school journalists. Maybe what we can do is we can put him in touch with our editor of Ad Astra and give him some advice to Rod Pyle. So we'll do that, uh, uh, Beckett. So thanks, thanks for that answer. So let me just ask a question. You described the, the experiences, 3,500 journalists who are obviously professional journalists. You, you know, you're surrounded by all of them. You're exposed to all these amazing things. How did that feel as being a, you know, did you ever think of yourself, well, I'm not a real journalist, I'm a college journalist, or did you just embrace it all and say, hey, we deserve to be here as well? Well, it's the second one. I mean, you know, I've been asked, well, did these other people look down on you or anything like that because you were just a college journalist? And I mean, the truth is, is that they ignored us. Uh, you know, the, everybody was going about doing their doing their thing. And, uh, um, at, you know, at the, at the time, I kind of understood that this would be kind of a historic event. I mean, that's why I saved like the uh, room reservation card and the, the airline ticket and stuff like that. But, but it, it, it took a number of years for it really to, um, to sink in. And, uh, the, um, and then the, the result of that was that I um, you know, um, wrote this book. Uh, I was a teenage space reporter, which was published uh, two years ago for the 50th anniversary. And I felt that the 50th anniversary was a good time to look back and to look at the context of what had happened. And one of the things that motivated me at, at the press conference before, Von Braun was asked, how, what, to what event would you compare going to the moon for the first time? And he said that it was comparable to um, amphibians coming out of the water onto the land. And at the time, I thought that was a little bit hyperbole. But uh, in, in many sense, that's true, that space is a whole new environment and that, uh, um, you know, that, that we should uh, um, em embrace that, that this is part of the exploration that started uh, when humans first uh, um, developed in, in Africa and then spread to all the continents. And, and then spread to the air with uh, air, airplanes and now have sp sp gone to space. And uh, um, I agree with NSS and I agree with Elon Musk that uh, we need to become a spacefaring civilization, a multi-planetary civilization. And uh, I'm always grateful that I was lucky enough to be there for the start of this. Very good. Uh, you mentioned in your book about uh, meeting the Apollo 11 crew many years later. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, you know, obviously these these three men were big heroes of mine. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity um, to uh, briefly meet all of them. Uh, but 
you know, I certainly was not friends with them at all, but I, I had encounters with them. And um, Neil Armstrong became uh, a real, almost like rock star. And I'll, I remember um, he was at the 40th anniversary celebration for Apollo 12, uh, sponsored by the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. And so when he walked in, he was like surrounded by security, you know, like, like some president or something like that. But I saw why, because dozens of people like swarmed on him and tried to get pictures with him and, and stuff like that. Uh, and so, um, although, you know, he was always kind of a private person, uh, this kind of rock star notoriety, I think he was very uncomfortable with. Um, Buzz Aldrin has been the most public of all of these um, people. And uh, for many years, he attended some of these space meetings like Space Fest. Uh, I think he was at ISDC uh, and, and stuff like that. So he's been, been more out front uh, and, and also more controversial uh, too. Uh, my real hero among the Apollo 11 crew was Mike Collins. And one of the great joys I had was to present Mike in person a copy of my book uh, at, um, at Space Fest in 2019 in Tucson. Uh, and uh, I uh, met him a couple of times and uh, he, Mike Collins was a real Renaissance man. Uh, he was a fighter, he was a, a test pilot. Uh, he was an astronaut, uh, he was an author. He wrote probably the best of the astronaut biographies carrying the fire. Uh, he was the first director of the National Air and Space Museum in, in Washington. And uh, he had a, a really wicked sense of humor, uh, self-deprecating and wicked sense of humor, and was, was a marvelous writer as well. Uh, and I, if you haven't read it, I really recommend his book, Carrying the Fire. Oh, yes, it's a classic. Very good. A uh, question that came in from Carl, and I'll tie it into another question, you know, asking about how many moonwalkers are still alive, but have you met all, had you met all 12 moonwalkers? I did not meet Alan Shepard, uh, and I did not meet, meet Pete Conrad, and both of whom I really would have liked to have in, encountered, uh, but I, I met all the other of them. Um, and sadly, uh, you know, as the years go on, there's only four of the 12 moonwalkers are still alive. Um, uh, Charlie Duke and uh, Dave Scott uh, and Buzz Aldrin uh, and Harrison Jack Schmidt are the four that are still alive. Yes, I've, I've met 10 as well, but I've uh, missed Jim Irwin and John Young. So all right. the others, yeah, met all the others. So it's, a, it's just, a, a, just an amazing feeling. There was a question that came in from uh, David, another David, uh, asking about how the launch sounds, uh, you know, uh, compare between Saturn and shuttle. Had you seen a, a shuttle launch in person to, to make that I, comparison? I did not see a shuttle launch in, in person. Um, the, um, the, the main difference is the shuttle has solid rocket boosters. And so that adds another dimension to, um, to the sound. Uh, from what I've told, the Saturn V is, is, uh, was louder. Uh, overall. Uh, and um, again, the, the kind of creepy thing was, the, you know, I didn't realize that it would take so long for the sound to reach us as, as the rocket took off. Uh, and uh, because it, it took, uh, you know, several seconds for the rocket to clear the tower. And it wasn't until the tower was cleared uh, that we actually started to hear the sound. A question about launches there to Cape. Uh, this is from William. Said one of Deke Slayton's colleagues discussed viewing Apollo launches from the top of the VAB. Uh, any mention when you were there? Was that is that just a uh, an old space tale, or did people were people able to watch the launches from the top of the VAB? Uh, the VIPs and journalists in general were not able to do that, uh, and I'm not sure uh, about who was allowed to do that. Although I agree that I've heard that some people had that opportunity. I did, I remember reading uh, Mike Mullane's son was talking about witnessing the launch uh, from the top of the VAB. So they might've done that during some of the shuttle launches. So uh, an interesting question. <laughs> you mentioned in your, in your book and you show in your slides, uh, some of this amazing space memorabilia that you have. And you started collecting back in uh, for the Gemini four flight in 1965. And so, 
what was some of your strategy to collect autographs? And, you know, is there, someone did ask, you know, do you have a most interesting artifact? And it sounds like the one that's most sentimental to you, you already described that map signed by Neil Armstrong, but any additional comments on that related to space memorabilia? Well, it, it's changed quite a bit through the years. In the early days, like in Mercury and Gemini, um, you could write, you know, hand type letters uh, again, this is before the internet and everything, um, but I would sit down at a typewriter and, and uh, type out a letter to a particular astronaut and ask them to sign through the mail. I would either send them a, you know, a launch envelope or request that they send a, a, a NASA lithograph. And uh, many times they, at the beginning they, they did. Now, what, because they received so many requests, what happened was, was that they answered many of these requests uh, with so-called auto pen signatures. Auto pens are mechanical devices that reproduce a signature. And you can, you can tell that they're auto pen because they're all alike. So if you compare you know, three or four different signatures, you can see that there were certain auto pen patterns. So many of the autograph requests were, were with auto pen uh, replies. But many of them were also, um, you know, in original ones through the mail, uh, and uh, so through the years, I was able to um, get some signed items from, uh, all, you know, at all the moonwalkers, uh, all twelve, and uh, and then into the early part of the shuttle era too. Had a question uh, about uh, good books to read related to Apollo. And, uh, and again, everybody, uh, uh, and David and Marvin didn't ask me to do this, but again, I'll show, I'll show uh, David's book. And Marvin also has a book called uh, Apollo Memories. So I'll, I'll, you know, to answer that question about books you should read, these are personal stories that really are fascinating. So I would definitely recommend them. But uh, I'll ask both of you, uh, any, any books that you think people should absolutely read to learn about Apollo? Well, I think the, um, the two best books about Apollo in, in my uh, estimation are, first of all, uh, Mike Collins' um, Carrying the Fire, which he was first published in 1974, but then he's had uh, several updates through the years since then, usually on anniversaries of Apollo 11. But from the astronaut point of view, uh, that's, I think that's definitely the best book. The best overall book about Apollo is Andy Chaikin's uh, A Man on the Moon, which was published in 1994. And many of what we know about the, the moon flights uh, is, is from Andy. He spent like 10 years uh, interviewing uh, families, interviewing astronauts. Uh, and uh, that would be the, the best single, single book. Marvin, uh, similar recommendations? Um, all of the above. I have a couple favorites. I, I've, uh, I very much enjoyed Last Man on the Moon. Currently, I'm actually revisiting the early days of Mercury, reading the original We Seven with the editorial comments. I'm about halfway through that, but I'm enjoying going through the testing and the attitudes and uh, the development of the program back in the early days. The, um, the book Last Man on the Moon uh, is um, the book that Gene Cernan wrote. Uh, he was a commander of Apollo 17 and was literally the last man on the moon. And I, I agree with Marv that it's an um, excellent book. Another book that I enjoyed, uh, which not just about Apollo, but about mission control, was uh, Gene Kranz's book, Failure is Not an Option, uh, I think is an interesting book to give a view of um, what was going on on the ground. Very good. Uh, I think, let's see, we've got someone who raised their hand. We've got a little bit of time left. So why don't I allow them to uh, ask their question? So uh, Kerry, I'm going to allow you to talk and, and ask your question to David. Okay. Kerry, uh, you're on mute right now. Still on mute? Let me see if I can ask you to get you to unmute there. Is 
Hey, Bert and Tash, she says no question. Sorry about that. Oh, no question. Okay, she had her hand raised. So I just thought I would uh, I would ask. Why don't we go with a, a couple a couple more perspective questions? Uh, you know, you were there in 1969. You've both, in the, in the case, have been following the you know the space program from where we were in 1969 to where we are today. Is this what you expected? Would you? Would you, you know, do you have any perspective on, you know, where you, where we might have been at this point? Because uh, it's been a long time since that 1969. So, David, I'll start with you. Well, it's interesting. In 1969, President Nixon appointed something called the Space Task Group to look into the future of space. And this was a, a group headed by then Vice President Spiro Agnew. And they came up with a um, comprehensive plan to, um, to get the US um, to the moon uh, for scientific missions and also to, uh, to go to Mars, to land on Mars. And it was felt in 1969 that a, Mar a Mars landing, a crude Mars landing would be possible by the late 1980s. And as time has gone on uh, up until just recently, every time they had a commission or study it was Mars was always 20 years in the future, uh, you know, and, and there were a whole bunch of different studies. There was a study um, uh, written by uh, late astronaut Sally Ride uh, about future in space uh, and, uh, and that, but it's always 20 years in the future. And there was never a good solid plan of how to get to Mars. And I think that um, one of the exciting things that Elon Musk has done is he's kind of upset the apple cart uh, and proposed uh, some um, really uh, visionary uh, steps uh, to get to Mars. And while his timetable may be off, uh, he has some excellent engineers there at SpaceX, and they've really proven their worth in developing uh, reusable uh, satellite launches, as well as uh, Crew Dragon uh, and the, um, the flights to the space shuttle. So. Uh, I think it, it was looking pretty bleak for a while that we would never expand the, the space program. But what's really made a difference has been the internet billionaires like Musk and Jeff Bezos uh, and Sir Richard Branson and these people who are privately uh, spending hundreds of millions of dollars of their own to advance. Um, the space budget has kind of been stuck between like 21 and $23 billion with no prospects for any greater increase. But when you have somebody like Jeff Bezos who's spending a billion dollars a year of his own money, uh, that provides a, a additional resources. So to, to summarize, I was kind of pessimistic a few years ago that we would get anywhere, but as a result of um, uh, Bezos, Musk, Branson, and, and some others, uh, I think the future is much brighter. Very good. Thanks, David. Marvin, uh, your perspective? Well, I'm, I, I've been disappointed at our progress until recently. And uh, it, it took 42 years from the day Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic to land a man on the moon. I expected the same rate of progress. Uh, the night we landed, uh, Dave and I went to a, press, to a party at the Hilton and all the companies were represented and we both signed up for a, a charter airline called Trans International Airlines. And we made uh, reservations for a lunar Hilton. And I fully expected to be able to use those reservations in some time in the next 40 years or so. Well, it's been 52 years since then, and I'm still waiting to go. But um, I'm greatly enthused by the, uh, by, by the progress the companies have made, uh, taking the, uh, the cost uh, down by so many different orders of magnitude is a major contribution. And I commend the people putting their own money first I still think NASA should still be involved and should still continue um, an, an independent path, but uh, cooperate when they can and such. Uh, I'm always, the program has always waxed and waned so many times over the years. I mean, when we started off, they were planning to go to Apollo 20. They were, they, they stopped, uh, which I think was a big mistake, production of the Saturn V. We're only now getting to the point where we can launch something with that kind of throw weight. Imagine if we had the Saturn V assembly line continuing, what we would have been able to do and what we could have assembled. I'm not saying we could have gone to Mars. There's still many fundamental problems uh, to go to Mars um, involving the time. I, I don't think the human body can 
take that kind of isolation or radiation at this point or decline of the immune system. There's too many different things that have not been worked out yet. Uh, it, the, the time will come, these problems will be dealt with. Eventually man will inhabit Mars. And I think we have to do this. We must, as Dave says, and others have said, we have to become a multi-planetary species. But I'm more optimistic now than I've been in a long time. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, I'll take one last question that came in on the chat. This also comes from a, from David. Uh, do you think that that the and I'll ask you this, David, because from the from a press perspective too, uh, do you think that declining press coverage of later Apollo flights helped in the fl in the flagging interest of Apollo and the canceling of the later Apollo missions? Kind of tie well, into um, that last comment from Marv. So I I think a couple of things happened at that time. Um, I, one of the main things was, if you remember, uh, the Vietnam War at that point was uh, consuming a large part of the budget. And uh, a lot of the cuts to NASA and other government programs uh, at, at the time was, was due to the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, secondly, was that um, uh, while President Johnson had been a firm believer and supporter in the space program over many, many years, uh, Nixon was not a big supporter of space. Uh, he saw it as something he could use for political gain. Uh, so that took a, a, a toll. The other thing is that um, I think that in some ways, NASA may have trivialized uh, the missions. And I've always been critical of Alan Shepard for taking that golf shot uh, on the moon. Uh, you know, some people find that it was humorous, but I think that it trivialized uh, what we were trying to do there. Uh, and I, uh, again, um, I think that Shepard should have paid more attention to the lunar science than uh, shooting a golf ball on the moon. I'll ask, well, I'll close out with one final question to each of you. Someone had asked about what was your most impressive, uh, what did you think the most impressive feat of Apollo was? So I can ask that to both of you. The, um, in my opinion, it was that we were able to get to the moon with a computer as primitive as the Apollo guidance computer. Uh, and that, uh, you know, if you, you know, anybody's cell phone has more computing power than the Apollo guidance computer, which was one of the first relatively small uh, uh, computers. Uh, but if, if you look at the details of that, you'll be aghast that they risked three people's lives uh, with, with such a um, minor, uh, uh, minor instrument as the Apollo guidance computer. Marvin, uh, any, any thoughts on that as well? Well, I would agree with that, of course. Again, I grew up in the era of uh, slide rolls and became kind of proficient at those myself. But um, the other aspect of the space program that, it, that a lot of people forget is the miniaturization that had to take place. Many of, and also the imaging, many of our medical, and Dave can talk about this too, but uh, many of the medical advances uh, and imaging were developed as a result of the space program. Again, every penny that was spent on that program was not spent worldwide, it was spent in this country and it's uh, new industries were started and, and it continued to be developed as a result. Um, going to the moon was a, a great idea overall. Again, it, it employed a lot of people, the technology uh, that we gained and the benefits were immense. I, I think the latest figure I saw was like, for every dollar spent, I think $16 were, were produced in return. So it was a great investment. And again, um, what we learned in such a short period of time, I honestly, and, and, and a couple of years ago, Dave and I were at the Apollo um, 8 reunion and uh, at, at the Chicago uh, Museum of Science and Industry and people were talking and the astronauts were talking then. And, and the consensus was generally that they don't think in eight and a half years you could do the same amount of progress, make the same amount of progress in such a short period of time today. There's too many different things, too many codes um, and second guessing. I, 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 again, a, a failure today uh, grounds a program for years and years. If Apollo 11 had not successfully landed, Apollo 12 was ready to go and Apollo 13 was ready to go yet for the final launch window of that year. Uh, obviously, they would have tried to find out what went wrong, but uh, the, the idea was there was a goal, and we were committed to it, and and we achieved it. 
Very good. On that very positive note, uh, I want to close out tonight. And so it was really, really enjoyable. Just a lot of fun to, to hear this story. So David, I just want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time to share this amazing story that you had uh, and giving us a, a sense of it. Uh, it was, uh, and I, I do encourage everybody to go out there and, and read your book to get a, a, you know, even more perspective. And Marvin as well, just to, sharing that, that you, you, know, you guys experienced something that is just truly amazing as we think about it today. And I know people talking about seeing a Saturn V launch, but you saw Apollo 11 launch. So that's pretty significant. So thank you both uh, for taking the time to be here. Uh, we really appreciated it. Uh, I'd like to close out and thank Larry Ahern, my uh, colleague from the NSS, who has joined us, Vice President of Chapters, uh, Aleph Martin, who is our Director of Social Media, and also, as always, Fred Becker, uh, who manages all the technology and handles all this great stuff for us to make sure these town halls and space forums uh, continue. So, so thank you all for that. What I will do now, real quick, everybody, is just share my screen one more time. And uh, and just let's see, here we go. Let me just do this. I just got to get the, uh, I'm struggling with technology now. <laughs> here we go and we'll share and we'll close that. So again, everybody, I just want to thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, it was an another fun night in terms of our programming. Uh, so I do remind you that we are taking uh, the next few weeks off and we'll be back on the 9th of September. So look for uh, the invites when we're talking about the uh, policy committee. So thank you all for attending. Uh, for those of you who are in the evening time zones, have a great evening. If you're in tomorrow's time zones, wishing you a great day and for everybody a great weekend ahead. And as always, stay safe. So thank you all, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.